The reading today is taken from Matthew 20, uh, verses 1 to 16. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you should also, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who had hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who, hired last work, last, <laughs> who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for Denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't have the right to do what I want with my own money. Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Thank you, Barry. Um, so I've got a nice bowl of grapes here. I think um, there you are. You can see that on the screen as well. I've got some um, red ones, green ones, black ones. And who likes grapes here? Hmm, quite a lot of you like grapes. Um, it's a shame because I would be happy to pass them round and share them, but I'm not allowed to. Um, so it just means I've got to eat them all myself here. And they're so good. <laughs> um, excuse me a minute. Do you know, actually, this, this, actually this time of year is um, normally we're celebrating harvest. And we'd have um, a harvest service and so on and bring produce along and things. Of course, that isn't happening this year in the same way. But it's around this kind of time, around the end of September that we would normally do this. Um, and uh, the story I've chosen today to do here is about harvest time. It's this story of a vineyard um, owner and who would be growing grapes. don't know whether they'd be as the same as that or not, but he'd be growing his grapes in his vineyard. And the vineyard uh, is an age-old image or, that, that is used in the Bible, an age-old image of Israel. In, in Isaiah chapter 5, we read about um, God being likened to a vineyard owner, and he's frustrated at the poor grapes that his vineyard has uh, been producing. So um, the, the vineyard is often used as a picture. So Israel, the, the, the Jews would be very used to the imagery of this story that Jesus uses to illustrate a point here. Um, and he tells this story about um, a, a, a lot of unemployed workers who would be meeting in the marketplace. That's what they did. It was kind of like the marketplace where they would gather would be a bit like the job center. Um, and they would stand there in the day. These would be primarily unskilled workers who would be waiting for work that day so that they could um, earn enough money to eat that evening. Um, and so they, they'd get the uh, stand around, and the employer would usually come down, some, the, uh, an employer or the foreman would come, and he would um, select some workers and take them off, and they would go and work from dawn until dusk. 
that's, um, let's say, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. They would work for the day there. And a denarius was a, a, a good wage, really, for an unskilled worker for the day. So it was, in, in this story, when he was paying a denarius to the worker, that was a, a, a good wage for the day. Um, they would have been happy with that. So, um, so on this particular day, he starts at 6 a.m. We've got it here. And he goes to the marketplace and he finds some um, workers there and says, my vineyard's ready. My grapes are all looking wonderful. Um, I want you to come and um, help gather these grapes in. So 6 a.m. he goes, gets the workers and they go off. Later on, and whether this is because he wanted to spread it out through the day or whether it's because um, he realized he was going to need more workers because the first ones weren't quick enough, I don't know. But he goes back to the marketplace and he gets some more. Um, and now it's about, um, let's move this round, it's about nine o'clock. There we are. It's about nine o'clock now. And um, these people, he gets to come and do it. And he says to them, they say, what, what are you going to pay us for doing this? He said, I'll, I'll pay you whatever is right. He doesn't say he's going to pay him a denarius. He says, I'm going to pay you whatever's right. That's at nine o'clock. And then um, it carries on the day. And at about 12 o'clock, he goes back to the marketplace. And he does the same again. Gets some more workers three hours later and takes them to go and work. And then the same thing happens at three o'clock. He goes back and gets some more workers and takes them off to the marketplace. You're shaking your head. Is that better? Yes. That is better. Right. Thank you for that observation. <laughs> I wondered how long it would take you to spot that deliberate mistake. But well done. So it's now three o'clock in the afternoon. And, and um, he's now got... How many lots of workers has he sent so far? How many groups? Four. Four, six o'clock, nine o'clock, twelve o'clock, three o'clock. Okay, they've all gone. And now he sends his last group along. He comes again, and now it's five o'clock. Um, all the other ones have been three hours apart, but this is five o'clock. Why would it be five o'clock and not six o'clock? Because if it was six o'clock, he's done. The day's finished. So it's the last hour of the day. He comes back. There's only an hour to go, and he gets these guys, and he says, what are you doing standing around here? And we're not sure by the tone of what it says in the, in the story whether or not it's a kind of bit of a rebuke about why you're standing around not doing anything or whether he's actually kind of saying, well, what, what are you up to? Um, you know, you, you stand there. Why haven't you gone out to work like everybody else? And, and they say, um, no, it's, it's not because we don't want to work. We're, we just haven't got any work yet. No one's come to get us. Now, at this point, if these workers don't get work before 6 o'clock, what would happen is they wouldn't necessarily have enough money that day to eat that evening because they earn what they want for the evening meal. That's why in Jewish law they had to be paid on the same day that they did the work rather than waiting until later because people lived like that a lot of the time, particularly the unskilled workers. So, um, so five o'clock he comes and he says to them, okay, will you go and work in my field as well? And so they go and work in the field and then we get round to... Six o'clock, and the day is done, and all the workers come back again. And when they come um, back, um, then it's time for payment to be made. So he starts with the last workers, and, um, and he's, he said to them, I'm going to pay you whatever's right. Um, now, normally, they would be paid relative to the amount of work that they'd done for the day. So you would think, and I would think, the people who'd only worked the hour would get a lot less. And the people who'd worked the full day would either get the denarius that they'd got, um, and they would get a lot less than a denarius, or he'd decide to pay them more. Does that make sense? That's what we do, isn't it? But what we've got to remember is in this story that it starts off by saying, for the kingdom of heaven is like this. And we know the kingdom of heaven and its values and everything else kind of turn things on the head a bit, don't they? Everything's always different to what we'd expect in the world with the kingdom of heaven. So things are different. The unions up in arms would be up in arms in this day. They wouldn't be happy with this at all. But God's kingdom ways are different. And this is what Jesus wants us to realize. 
There's three surprises in particular to note that teach us something really about God and his kingdom. One is the employer actually cares about the poor and needy people. Um, he goes out to meet them himself. He doesn't send his foreman. He goes there to meet them himself. That reminds us of Christ, of Jesus Christ, who God himself come in in human form to, to be with us and to reach out to us. The employer is, number two, the employer is so generous, he pays them all the same wage, even though some have done less. He's a generous God who gives us what we don't deserve. And third, the employer calls the complainer friend before he challenges him for justice. But don't you think that's interesting? The last one, the, last, the ones who come back and they're complaining at the end and they're saying, oh, hold on a minute, why have they got that and, and we've only got this? Well, that's not right. And he starts off by saying friend. It's an interesting term why Jesus uses that. It's only, it's only used three times in the Bible that Jesus says it. And they're all in Matthew. And in each case in Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, verse 12, he says it to a man who's not wearing wedding clothes in a parable about wedding. And the man who's not wearing wedding clothes who wanted to come to the wedding, he was in the wrong. And he used it in Matthew 26, verse 50, with Judas arriving. And, um, and when Judas arrives with the soldiers to betray Jesus, and he says to Judas, friend, as well. In these cases, in these incidents, the person was in the wrong. And in this case, they were in the wrong as well. But Jesus still uses this term. It's a kind of ironical term, in a sense. Um, the employer is just. He's fulfilled his contract. Actually, to want to change the terms of the contract now and want more than the denarius is wrong. The employer is being just and doing what he said he would do by paying them a denarius. And he says, if I want to be more generous than that with the other ones, isn't that my right to do that? So what else can we learn about the kingdom of God from this? Because that's what this is about. But we have to look at the, well, the story in the context as well. So the story follows on from the end of chapter 29. The very last line of the end of, sorry, chapter 19. The very last line of chapter 19 says... But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And then it goes into this story. And guess how this story ends? This story ends with, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. So it's, it's, the story is in the middle of these two things. So that's telling us something about what this story is about as well. The rich young man is in chapter 19. That's the story that's just preceded it. And his question is, what more must I do to get eternal life? And this passage is saying it doesn't matter how hard you work or anything else. You get, you get life, you get the, the meal on the table, if you like. You get what you need to keep living. And in eternal life terms, that's salvation. You get that through the generosity of God, not by something you can do, not by something you can earn by working harder. And of course, many people think that if they're good, if they live a really good life and they, and they work hard at that and doing things to help other people, whatever, that will earn them salvation. It doesn't. Or if they're very religious and they follow lots of religious ways, that will earn them salvation. It doesn't. It's a generous gift of God. He came to us and gives us that gift. He provided for us. We've got to trust his word, be about the work, and then but we, we will get our reward. But it's trust in him. It's his generosity. And um, Peter, in chapter 19, had said, we've left everything, so what reward's there for us? You know, what, what reward is there going to be for us? We've given up everything for you, Jesus. And it's at the end of that when this first shall be last and last shall be first bit comes. And Jesus says, you know, um, well, what he's saying in this is there may well be reward for you for the future, but that should never be our motivation for better reward. It should be out of grateful response to God. If you're only doing it to get a better thing, that's, a, that's not going to help you. That's not a right motivation. When our focus is on the rewards rather than our response to God's provision, it will end badly. I was thinking about this and just reflecting on it a bit more. Um, particularly yesterday, I was just reflecting on it. You know, I think it makes us, it can make us unhappy 
and, and, and grumble like, um, like the man in this story did, the, the people in this story did. Um, when, we, when, we, when we're in it for the reward, when we want something more for what we do. In this story, the, 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 the owner says, are you envious because I am generous? Are you envious because I am generous? It kind of made me think about, you know, how we should be glad for others when good stuff happens for them. What can, what, wouldn't it be a great attitude if the people who had been there all day, and this cuts against our own values and everything that we might think within us about what justice is, but if the people who had worked there all day, and they've got the denarius, which is what they wanted, and they're getting to go home and have their meal, which so they're all happy, they've got what they want, wouldn't it be wonderful if they were happy that the people had only gone at five o'clock and only worked an hour, they managed to get enough money to go home and have their meal as well that evening. And, and even the people that came at three o'clock or 12 o'clock, if they had an attitude change of mind that they were, that's great, you've got a denarius too. You're getting to go home and have a good meal too tonight. That's, it, it cuts across everything that we might think in earthly values but to be happy for others at the fortune at the blessing if you like is a it, it actually it's good for them because they've been blessed and it's good for us because we are we feel good about it we're not we're not the alternative to that is to feel envious the alternative to that is to feel well I haven't got as good a deal as that and that makes me unhappy now when I should be happy I've got my denarius so there's a, a, an attitude thing here, a challenge to us through this story, to be happy when others are blessed, to rejoice when others get something, even if it may seem to be at our expense. If they are blessed, that's a whole different way of thinking. Being generous makes others happy. I thought about this in different practical ways in life, like in a, in a restaurant, if you're giving a tip, and, I'm, and, and sometimes, you know, I don't know about you, um, you're probably nothing like this at all, but when I'm thinking about giving the tip, I'm thinking, hmm, has the service been good enough? Um, do I want to leave a tip, really? Because that, that, that few quid would be better in my pocket than theirs. I could go and spend it on something else later, and I don't know when I want to give it them, you know? Um, I don't tip in McDonald's. Why should I do it in the restaurant here? Um, I'm kind of, you know, got all them kind of things. But actually, if I leave a tip in the restaurant for that person, and if it's a generous tip, that's going to be a real blessing to them. It may be a sacrifice for me, but it's going to really bless them. And I can make them really happy that day. And that's a, a really positive thing. Now, they may not deserve it even. And if they don't deserve it and they've been rude and I do it, it's even more of a kind of blessing for them. And do you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I was trying to think of ways we can do it. But, but being a blessing to other people um, and being glad that they are provided for. So who might complain at this story? Um, at the end of the day, how would this be received? Well, the Pharisees, they thought that they were more righteous and better than others because they did all the right things religiously. They deserved more. Jesus is saying, doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. You, you don't earn it in that kind of way. Um, and the Jews think it's unfair that they've followed God for centuries and now the Gentiles are getting saved too. They've been following God throughout history. Yes, they've messed up along the way, but they've followed him such a long time. How can the Gentiles be let in now into this? That was going to be happening. And how can this message be for all? And they get just the same blessing. They get to inherit eternal life as well. Um, so it's a warning against that attitude, saying don't be like that about it. Be glad that they too can inherit now. Those who aren't Jews can inherit the kingdom of God as well. The disciples could be saying, well, we've given everything up to follow you, Jesus. That's what the disciples have just said in chapter 19, just before this passage. The, Peter says, well, we've given up everything. What rewards for us? It's, it's kind of a warning against that attitude where later on other people too will inherit and they may not have been through all the things that the disciples have. Lots of disciples were killed for their faith in Jesus, but, but we received the reward as well, even if we're not. And don't go through all the persecution they did. We receive eternal life too through faith in Jesus. So it's a warning against that. Don't have that as your motivation. And church members in Matthew's church who had been there a long time and then other believers coming in afterwards. 
Um, you know, don't begrudge them that and, and put them down, but treat them as, as equal within the church and be glad for them as well coming in. The characteristics of these workers who are the early ones who complain, well, they find other people who are disgruntled, they grumble with each other, they complain and focus on the negative. They overlook all the good. The good is this, the harvest is now in and all the workers have been fed and, and they should be praising God for that, not grumbling about it. This is the parable of Jesus. It talks about those kingdom values being very different in God's kingdom. And the message um, for, for anyone watching who, who isn't a believer in Jesus at the moment is this. It's only by faith in Jesus that you can be saved. It's not by anything you do or any good deeds or any actions. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. And for us, we should not have our focus on reward, um, but our focus on, uh, on a response to God in everything we do out of gratefulness, to be about his work and his business, not for what we can get out of it, but because he's been so good to us in providing for us. And that's what harvest time is about as well. It's about thanking God for his provision for us in those physical ways as well. But we thank him today for what that means for us spiritually, the new life we have in him.